um, on today's topic, the legal and technical issues surrounding our increasing dependence on applications. Mm -hmm. So why don't we begin just by each of you maybe giving a, a, your high-level thoughts on how uh, the changing climate um, uh, our dependence on applications, the risks surrounding them, um, our literacy about the applications we're using, anything that's just a particular interest or note in the right. times we're in. Mm -hmm. so, Absolutely. Well, it. sure, I'll, I'll start. Well, it's a pleasure to talk with you again, Sebastian, and uh, always great to see you. Uh, application security is so incredibly important for so many companies now both from a legal and technical standpoint, because since last year, there has been new federal law in the books called the Defend Trade Secrets Act. And the Defend Trade Secrets Act is federal legislation about the misappropriation of trade secrets. It amended the Economic Espionage Act that uh, was its precursor. And the major difference here is that now, under federal law, individuals that hold trade secrets or organizations or companies that hold trade secrets no matter how they are whether it's source code whether it's confidential uh, business processes or uh, customer lists uh, those trade secrets if they are misappropriated companies now have a private right of action to go into federal court and make a claim for damages for the misappropriation of those trade secrets and critical to making a claim for the misappropriation of trade secrets is the fact that the data itself or the processes itself have to be protected by reasonable means of protection. So there's a, there's a catch, right? You can't just go after everyone who may have taken something of value. It has to be a, something of value and clearly treated as a secret essentially from cradle to grave. And is there a standard for that? Well, that's exactly right. Uh, look, yeah, I think the best way to, to think about it is to compare it to patents, right? Mm -hmm. So a patent is something that you can prosecute if somebody infringes your patents. But in order to obtain a patent, you essentially have to broadcast out what your technology is to the rest of the world. And that allows people to copy, but then you have patent prosecution to protect you. With a trade secret, it's the exact opposite. Uh, patents are only applicable for a certain period of time. Trade secrets are indefinite. The best way to think about a, the, the quintessential trade secret is the formula of Coke. Coke has been around for a really, really long time, and it's always been a very well-guarded trade secret. Nobody would ever try to claim that the secret ingredients for Coke are not in a trade secret. So what's really critical is that a trade secret is something that has economic value to a company. That's number one. That's the first problem that we have to establish, that it's something worth protecting. It has value. And number two, that it actually is secret. Right? And by secret, we mean that there have been reasonable means to protect the confidentiality of that particular trade secret. And there's a context to that, right? Um, what you would expect to be a reasonable practice to keep something secret 20 years ago is probably nowhere near sufficient uh, to keeping something secret in today's world. Yeah, right? I, I think and, that's right. And, and so maybe I'll, I'll uh, invite Robert in to, to the conversation, um, not as a, as a hardcore hacker, but somebody certainly who, who is, is immersed in that community, certainly, and, and okay. interacts with them. Has the, has the, um, how, have the tools and or the attitude towards probing, tweaking, hacking, code, are, are those evolving as quickly as everything else around us? Well, certainly. In fact, they're developing a lot faster than the than, um, people are coming up with new exploits. And it's something I've noticed, like, um, while the, a few top companies like Apple and Google are getting better at security, the rest of the market, the, the mid-sized companies like Cisco and the even smaller mm -hmm. ones are even worse in just not implementing the uh, basic mitigation technology. So every year, the uh, these um, exploits become more widely available and easier to use, so that even somebody without hardcore hacking skills can use them. That's right. So I've actually heard recently that that people are uh, you can go into the the quote unquote dark web, and you can get essentially do it yourself hacking kits where they where sort of the the, 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 the trade secrets, if you will, the innovation around hacking has been bottled up and you can just use Bitcoin or some other way to pay for it and 
just the way we drive a car without understanding how the, the motor engine works, um, I can start hacking if I want without really understanding how I'm doing it. Uh, it's not you don't even have to uh, go to the dark web for it. A lot of this, a lot of the basic tools are uh, open source and hosted in GitHub. So, um, and they not increasingly have graphical uh, user interface front ends. So it's it's just extremely easy to use. And, yeah, and I think building on that too. And one of the things that we play with quite a bit in our line of work, which is information security law, is Kali Linux. And you know the standard installation of Kali Linux has got. You know, its own set of app. It's basically its own application toolkit designed mm -hmm. specifically to reverse engineer products, and that's a big problem. So, basically, in order, to, you know, what the trade secret legislation has done. Is that mine? Mm -hmm. no, it's, yeah. So what? So, so I think one of the interesting things uh, is uh, one of the interesting aspects um, of the, the emergence of trade secret legislation, both in the U.S. federal and, and in Europe, there's a, there's a, uh, a European act there as well, um, is that it's providing clarity around what it means to keep, to secure software. And then that is going to come out and, and be used in other contexts. So you might say my application is worth protecting, mm -hmm. but not because it has trade secrets. It's worth protecting maybe because if its, if its behavior is circumvented or undermined, horrible things might happen on a factory floor or on city streets or inside a hospital, right? And so the definition of, of, the, of worth isn't just trade secret, but, but this legislation is providing context. So um, it, it, there's this whole notion of negligence mm -hmm. around building a medical device, perhaps, yes. right? So might the definition of what it means to harden software against a malicious exploit, if that becomes so well understood, if you don't protect your software against common attacks, mm. is that negligence? Would, would, do you think courts are thinking that way or regulators are starting to think that way? Yes, I think they definitely are. It's actually very funny that you bring that up because when I was in law school, it's actually one of the things on which I wrote my law review note was, uh, uh, it was about the prosecution of hackers and, and the protection of secrets, as a matter of fact. Uh, one of the things that I argued back in, I guess when I wrote this was 2004, was that a negligence standard actually should apply to software that is not open source and that is developed. And so if you look at the negligence standard, it certainly does apply to the way software is manufactured these days. There is a duty, uh, well, the negligence standard, if I can step back, requires there to be a duty, a breach, proximate cause, and damages. And I think it's very fair to say that software manufacturers owe a duty of care to their customers to make sure that their data is protected, to make sure that there are the right information security uh, protocols and mechanisms in place to protect application level data from being exfiltrated too easily. Um, and that if there is a breach of that duty, then that will proximately cause damages. And that can be, that, those damages can take any number of forms. It can be the release of PII, personally identifying information. It can be the release of personal health information. If it is, let's say, a medical device, it could result in something catastrophic like patient death. And uh, so these are very, very serious issues, and I think that the law has evolved. Um, one of the things Robert and I actually were talking about earlier today was the fact that the FTC has actually stepped in, and with respect to applications, uh, if you are a company that claims to have reasonable security preca uh, precautions baked into your products and they are not there, the FTC will, say, will see that essentially as a deceptive trade practice and you can be subject to fines and sanctions for not complying with that which you said you were doing in the first instance. So that's, that's a big problem for software manufacturers these days, software developers. Um, to go back to the issue, if you want to talk about a, a pretty horrific story, which I'm shocked hasn't received as much press as it should. There was a medical device manufacturer at the end of the summer last year 
called, um, I think it was St. Jude Medical. St. Jude Medical produced a pacemaker that had a device in the home. I don't know who thought this was a good idea, but it was a device in a home that would essentially connect with your pacemaker. And a company by the name of MedSec got hold of one of these pacemaker devices together with the, the uh, device that was installed in the home that would essentially allow you to read what the battery levels of the pacemaker are and some other functions as well. And they were not under contract from St. Jude Medical to begin reverse engineering this particular product. What they were able to do was take apart the nuts and bolts, look at the application data, and figure out what was going on under the hood. And what they figured out was that if they sent a bunch of malformed packets, this is my understanding of this, is that malformed packets uh, uh, along with a bunch of other garbage data could be sent back and forth to the pacemaker and that would eventually drain the battery and cause patient death. This was a big problem. So what did they do with this information? Normally, the normal if you discover a vulnerability, there are certain normal channels that you would use to disclose the vulnerability over to the manufacturer. MedSec, however, had other plans. What they did was they got in touch with Muddy Waters. Muddy Waters was an investment firm, an investment firm that made their money off shorting stocks. You can probably see where this is going. So they reached an agreement with Muddy Waters that said, we will split the profits from the short of this particular stock. We're going to let you know when we are going to release the vulnerability out into the wild, and that everybody will know this. And St. Jude Medical is a publicly traded company, and they did exactly that, and they made a ton of money. And to my knowledge, I haven't seen the SEC come down on them for this particular type of market manipulation because it is frightening, but it is the absolute opposite of insider trading. This is outside information that was developed by looking under the hood of an application and a device to manipulate a market based on outsider information. So the only lawsuits that I've seen filed against Muddy Waters and MedSec are actually for defamation, which probably don't really have great legs on them. And the other, um, but kind of blows me away, I think you're right. And mm -hmm. I think now, um, I don't think there's a business, a public company today that isn't in some way absolutely dependent on some class of application, either as operations, collections, customer relations, back office processing, something. And if you can use that vulnerability a vulnerability not to to steal f from the app or from the data flowing through the app but to manipulate markets that's like a, a whole other level absolutely and, and 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 again once it's been done once yes the next time it happens i think people will say well the first time it happened shame on us mm -hmm. now that you know it can happen yes. shame on you Yes. Right. Or so the that's other way around, right? right? I think, or maybe the other way around. Is it shame on shame you? on you, the person? Shame on me, right? right, right. I can't remember. Yes. Uh, right. But that, but but you bring you bring up, I think, a really excellent point here, Sebastian. Is that this was a methodology to manipulate the market on the basis of an application vulnerability that was discovered by what appears to be reverse engineering a product, right. looking at application level data and then figuring out how to um, exploit. The, the data that's going back and forth right. between the pacemaker and the device. And so that's an outlier event. Right. It has never happened before, but it made a lot of money. Well, first and of all, that we know of. That we know of. That's because another point. strategy they could have taken, and maybe they did, but were rebuffed, that's is right. they could have called that same dude first that's and true. say, we're about to release this, and it's going to damage your stock. Give us money, and we won't. And they might say, that's ridiculous. Yes. And maybe the first five companies said, we'll pay you. You know, that, that's an interesting point, too, because I, I think there may have actually even been some backstory uh, about contacts with St. Jude as well in this particular case. Um, but I think that the point to take away from the Muddy Waters, St. Jude, MedSec, uh, horror, horror story is that these outlier events that actually make money, well, that's a good indication that's, gonna, that's going to turn into a trend. That's right. People are going to see that as a great way to replicate what they did, and then you are going to have more attempts at market manipulation by discovering vulnerabilities in publicly traded companies. And it's not going to relate just to the medical device 
uh, field, it's going to relate to any field that uh, a publicly traded company relies upon for some kind of proprietary mm -hmm. product or data. It could be an industrial control system, mm -hmm. it could be um, an ignition switch for a car, That's it right. could be something that opens and closes a garage door. With the IoT, as it's called these days, uh, I think the possibilities are frankly limitless. So there's two, and, and, and so Robert, I'll get your feedback on this. There, there's two levels, or two levels to protecting your application. One is sort of what we've been discussing, which is companies need to make sure they're taking all of the proper steps to avoid these things from happening and, and avoid essentially looking like a victim that asked for it, that left the door open for the burglar to step through. Um, but, but a more fundamental set of requirements is I actually want to detect, defend, and, and recover from attempts, right? The best way to recover from an incident is to keep that incident from occurring at all, right? That's the best goal of a lock, right? The goal of a lock ultimately is to let bad guys know they shouldn't go in. I mean, that's the minimum. The best scenario is it keeps them from coming in, okay. right? So you, we were talking earlier, and you, you, were, talk, uh, you, you were telling me about um, a, a whole VPN sort of class of problem. I don't know if you could talk a little bit more uh, about first the, the what it, what the problem is um, and, and sort of the underlying t uh, technology vulnerability that, that really is at the root of it. That's correct. Uh, a lot of people, uh, people use VPNs to, um, when they're on public Wi-Fi, to encrypt their data. But, uh, and there are just tons of free uh, VPN software uh, and paid ones on, the, um, on Apple and Google's app stores. And recently, uh, it was discovered, like a security firm discovered that the vast majority of the the random sample they took had uh, were leaking data in the, in its entirety, and the entire purpose of these uh, these apps is encrypt all your data, um, they, and they because they all took advantage of one uh, specific um, API call in Android, the uh, Bind VPN service, and so that so once that was discovered, like basically all of them fell. And this is something pretty well known in the Android community that um, the, it's they have to be extra careful when implementing that API call. And they, the fact that they didn't even bother um, shows their negative So I think there's th there's two pieces to this that, that caught my attention. So the first is here's this really potent, powerful service. Yeah. And, and as I understand it, correct me if I'm wrong, it, it basically allows an application to intercept packets and either manipulate them and or redirect them. And that allows them, a good, a good actor will, will use that capability to encrypt data <laughs> before it ships off. Like that's the VPN yeah. scenario. And, and that, the research you're pointing to sort of talked about how um, uh, sort of some vendors were sloppy, maybe negligent in the earlier part of our conversation. Um, and that's fine, um, but what struck me is that I'm a bad actor who might come onto the scene after those developers have released that VPN software. And if they haven't done a good job at hardening that application, I might attach a debugger to that v their VPN software and misuse or reuse the services that the user has already accepted. They've already given permission, you know, for this app to have to, to call this service. But now I can say, don't just send the data encrypted to the endpoint that the user wants it to go to, but before you encrypt it, send it to my endpoint first. And and that's the power of the service, the underlying service, that you know a bad actor writing VPN software might in theory do. But it's also the kind of thing, correct me if I'm wrong, that a skilled um, a hacker with a with a debugger could essentially add after the fact, right? And there are tools also to prevent that. So for, for every attack or every hacking strategy, there are controls that, while never perfect, can make it materially more difficult, okay. right? And and again, one of the things I'm curious of your thoughts on is you know the the as we talked about um, you know manipulating an app to manipulate a market that's a new concept that 10 years ago you wouldn't fault a company um, 
for not thinking about and defending against. Because 10 years ago, it was just a crazy kind of uh, fantasy. Now that it's happened, you might punish a company that willfully ignored that risk, right? Similarly, right, this research is showing that developers who use this powerful service on Android, they need to be careful about how they use it. And buyers or users of software need to be aware that this service is called under the covers. But now the next level is, are they taking steps to prevent tampering? Okay. And so that's wave number two. But what's wave number three? What's wave number four, right? So, so is that what you meant when you said that the cadence, the speed at which these tools are evolving is actually faster okay. than the, the, the applications and the technology yeah, itself? The, the mouse is moving faster than the cat is. Cat and mouse. Yeah, <laughs> that's right, cat and mouse game, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, so there's another one you told me about um, that, that at some level it's kind of funny because the topic, uh, the, the subject matter I think is kind of goofy, um, but the consequences uh, are, are all too real. That was the, the Pokemon Go. Okay. So I don't know, you, you probably know, you know more about this than me. You want yeah, a lot of the, um, the they didn't, uh, Neon Tech, the company behind it, didn't, um, they were in a rush to release the product and they didn't um, implement basic debugger um, detection software um, or and a lot of sent a lot of data unencrypted over the network so people were able to very easily reverse engineer the product and get and send um, um, packets to the uh, Neontech servers uh, giving them free uh, uh, otherwise paid in-app services so um, a lot of not only were a lot of sales lost because of that, but uh, um, a lot of labor time. That, like now that the horse is out of the barn, a lot of labor time has gone into um, like patch, uh, finding uh, people that cheat. Uh, but it's kind of like fixing the problem down river because it's too late. If they had implemented a lot simpler things, the, um, the basic working of the app when it had been discovered. Mm. Right. So I think it's interesting. So so we all sort of laugh because we see the Pokemon cartoon and it's kind of goofy yeah. and we think, oh, what's the work? Because first of all, it's real money. Yeah. It's real people's jobs. Yeah. But but at least as important in my view is people use this information to to guide, track, um, and and ultimately um, attack children. Yes. So this is a real. This is the PII is at least as important. So now it's not about losing. Pro profit margins, it's about perhaps criminal liability. Yeah, I, I think you're right about that. And I would say, you know, look, any company that develops any software does not want that software to be leaking data too easily. Uh, you do not want to be claimed to have been negligent in the development of your code. And you don't want to be, and you will be, looking down the barrel of a class action for a data breach filed most likely in California because that's where all these cases are filed uh, in the event of even something that would be a minor breach because the plaintiff's bar monitors all of this and they know what to go after and in the discovery phase of that litigation you can bet your you know what that they are going to go after all of the vulnerability analyses that you performed or did not perform and they're going to want to know what you knew about your vulnerabilities or whether you turned a blind eye to the vulnerabilities in your software during the development process. And it's gonna be a very bad position to be in if you dug your head in the sand. Because this is a situation of, of what we discussed in Hope at the Hackers on Planet Earth conference is, you know, not having a policy will be considered a policy. Right. So again, we're, the, the, I think one of the things that I think is so striking and, and we have to just take a moment, is all of the categories and all of the rules that we get comfortable with, those change before you know it. And you have to track mm -hmm. those differences. So what do I no, So just listening to you two, I'm hearing, for example, um, that the actual steps you take to prevent bad things from happening are not just important to protect Mm -hmm. your work and protect the people who use your software mm -hmm. for real, but also to demonstrate to a court, to regulators, to the markets, mm -hmm. that you're doing the right thing so you don't get a second wave of punishment after the first breach. Yes. 
That's what, and, and the second thing that, that I think is worth stopping about is sometimes you've been talking about source code and application vulnerabilities and mm -hmm. using that to pirate software or to compromise software. Other times you slip into data mm -hmm. and I'm looking at data, but, but that is a false distinction mm -hmm. because data True. is often code not to get technical, but code often sure. consumes data of and course. treats it as instructions. Mm -hmm. And conversely, the code itself is generating or validating the data. So by compromising or changing code, right. I essentially compromise the, the data, data. Sure. right? And so this notion that, oh, I'm not a, I don't really care about our code. I just care about my patient record. Mm -hmm. But you got to care about the code then because I can get your you know, patient Absolutely. record. And conversely, I don't care about the patient record. That's the hospital's problem. I sell healthcare software. Mm -hmm. Well, if that data is corrupt and I'm the custodian of that data through my code, my code is worthless. Absolutely. Right? And that was your, your the, the pacemaker one, right? By Absolutely. making fake data, I, yes. d I found a vulnerability in the code that ultimately brought down a company or yes. a hospital. Well, and, and that's, I think, a really important point that you made there, too, which is let's say you are staring down the barrel of a class action for a data breach, and it may be even a minor breach, let's say it affects 5,000, 10,000 people. Um, either the damages from that lawsuit, or let's say sanctions coming from the FTC for let's say a deceptive trade practice. If you're a mid-sized company, if you're an SME, that could be an existential threat to your existence. Those fines could put you out of business for essentially putting your head in the sand and failing to spend a minimum amount of money on security or thinking about it can literally put you out of business a year or two down the road if you're not careful. So let's, let's um, maybe try to put a bow around this, right? Because mm -hmm. one is we all, I think we can all agree that what used to pass for a, a reasonable application risk management policy and strategy 10 years ago clearly is irrelevant, right? Yes. Probably even two years ago may be irrelevant. Um, so let's take a moment, say, if, if you had to characterize where, where people's heads should be at if you either build software yourself inside your company or you're dependent on customs or software that is built for you, today, it's okay. Yeah, there's something worrying about debuggers, mm -hmm. worrying about reverse engineering, but as we just said, these rules are going to change. So five years ago, somebody will be sitting around a similar table and say, gee, you know, in 2017, boy, did they have it easy. So naive, so simple, right? right? Sure. So, so what, what's the meta attitude? What's, what's the way people should think such that they can feel reasonably comfortable that today they're doing the right thing, but that will be true whatever today is like how, how do they stay on top of the policy management as opposed to the policies themselves? Yeah, well, look, I think the old methods of protecting trade secrets they're outdated, they arguably don't work, but we should still adhere to them as well. Make sure that they're siloed, make sure that they're audited. But when it comes to real security, what we should be doing today, if you're a software developer, there is absolutely no excuse for not understanding where your threats are. It's so well known that if you are distributing your application out into the wild, and if that application has some value or some worth to your company, if it contains your trade secrets in it, in the form of source code, then that has to be protected. Because if you know if your application is going to be used in China, to go back to, let's say, the Pokemon example, or in Russia, you can guarantee that there are going to be people trying to reverse engineer that source code uh, by, by attaching a debugger to the, to the binary. Uh, you know that that's going to happen. So you need to design around that during the development process. You need to implement reasonable means of protection. This is something that we've gone into in the past as well, but even a two-inch fence around, a sort, around source code is absolutely better than nothing. Because if you need to go into court and you need to prove that what you have is a trade secret, then you damn well better be able to prove that you treated it like a trade secret. And that means that you protected it. And so there is no excuse for not understanding that if your application is going into the wild to Russia, to China, to Ukraine, to anywhere, frankly, and it has value, it's going to there's going to be attempts to reverse engineer it. And, a, and, and you you know you call out 
the the uh, the obvious scary parts of the world, yes. perhaps. But but I mean, there are insider threats. There are oh, plenty of sure. cases where you know an engineer uh, leaves a company, mm-hmm. and two years later. You yes. know they're they're up and running, and and you know obviously if they're the key engineer, they don't need to steal anything. They may still be taking stuff in their heads that mm-hmm. they didn't own. But the reality is, code and data. Again, one is the other. The other is right. the first, right? Um, you know, if I if I can get to data as an insider through any of these means, particularly reverse engineering, mm-hmm. um, uh, you know. Th- um, again, I think uh, a court might ask, well, what did you do? By like asking somebody to sign something when they're uh, uh, on the first day of employment about confidentiality, well, that's important. People do it. I'm not a lawyer. You are. But mm-hmm. I think at this point, people expect annual orientation. They expect attestation. They expect training Absolutely. from the employees. But then they also expect the employers to not just you know, leave everything open because they yeah. signed a piece of paper, they're going to say, no, I, mean, I took reasonable steps uh, you know, to, to have a need-to-know policy and yes. to keep things out of the way. So, so, um, so would you agree that it's not just about international uh, uh, distribution of software, but, but really just, uh, do, just taking due care and diligence with, with, with stuff that's worth protecting? A- absolutely. I mean, there's uh, legal agreements like NDAs and PIAs are only going to get you so far you really need to have the data siloed, you need to have it audited, you need to have it protected inside as well as outside. That absolutely is right. And this new federal law, the Defend Trade Secrets Act, there are causes of action for that as well. In fact, many, many, many of the cases that have been filed in federal court are about that exact scenario where an employee who may or may not have been a key employee walks away with confidential data of a company. So. One of the things, uh, Robert, that you talked about, uh, you referenced sort of was when the Pokemon apps were released and because, oh, people looked at it and examined it. That's not because these, you know, there's a, a, a hardcore fringe group that tracks Pokemon, right? There, there's a community of, of, of hackers yeah. that love to look at everything and, the, and any publicity that anything might get attracts their attention, right? And so sometimes it's malicious, sometimes it's for social causes, sometimes it's financial benefit. Um, is this, you know, if you could share some anecdotes perhaps or your own experience, but is this a community that looks like it's going to get bored and, and dissipate the, the way, um, I don't know, the women's suffrage movement did at the, you know, in the beginning of the 20th century, not because Mm-hmm. Voting is not a right of everyone, but it became less of an issue, I guess, right. in the U.S., right? Um, but is this a community that's going away? Is this oh, a community no. that's growing? I mean, t- tell me about your experience. You know, what, what do you see? One of the primary motivations of uh, hackers are, is um, bravado and getting attention. There's, when, um, the ethic that motivates hackers is the freedom of information. So as, long, as much information as you can get out there, like dump into the wild, it's, it's almost like a currency that, um, a social currency that you can win. Um, and there's a ton of uh, one-up mischief that motivates this scene. So um, even, we know that the financial value of, the, of this stuff uh, of, that's stored in these apps and services is increasing exponentially. But also, but, and so that, that will attract uh, the uh, more financially motivated. Which um, hacker community, which is probably even scarier. Um, a lot of overly educated people in Eastern Europe with uh, that are underemployed. That's how they make a living, and it doesn't seem like it's going to change anytime soon. So. I mean, you, um, Alex. I mean, you've been also. I mean, a part of this community, the mm-hmm. hacker community, for for sure. twenty years. Yeah. Have, is it growing? Is it is it is it is it changing? Is it what? What is this community? Is it going to be like the people who love doo-wop and, you know, just every five, yeah. ten years it's dwindling, you know? <laughs> right. Uh, it doesn't mean yeah. doo-wop isn't great, but it's just sure. it's time has passed, perhaps. Yeah. Is that what's going to happen to hackers? Or? No, I don't think so. I think I think as a community, it's getting larger and larger. People are understanding it. Um, there's also a lot of misunderstandings about the hacker community, of course. Um, I think the biggest is that hackers are often conflated with criminals. Right. And I think, as Robert mentioned, very rightly so. Um, 
it's, for hackers, it's not about a monetary incentive. It's about knowledge. It's about figuring out how something works. If you give them something, they're going to take it apart and look at the inner workings of it, and whether they can piece it back together or not. Um, it's just about understanding how things work and sharing that knowledge. Right. The, the most, just to, not to interrupt you, but yes. one of the most popular tracks at the Hope Conference mm -hmm. was lockpicking. Yes. And and these were not burglars. These were no. not people who were yeah. trying, I mean, if you saw the way, you know, they, they, they the dressed shit. and everything, they were not trying to be subtle oh, no. and discreet. They, they, it's all about taking oh. something apart, you're, putting it back together, and you're sharing it. Right. Like that, I mean, that, you're right. That animates them. It, it, it really does. Every That's a good example, actually, because every single hacker conference you go to anywhere around the world, right. there's always some form of lock picking happening. And it's just a, a sort of a physical manifestation of the hacker ethos. There is that. So, so it's you told me I right. can't get in, I'm going to try to get in. Right. I'm going to show you that I can. Right. And again, in terms of categories, it, it, I think you're right. I'm glad we touched on this. It, it's an important distinction. There is a hacker persona, mm -hmm. and that persona is, is alive and well and growing. Yeah. And so therefore, you can be assured if you're building software, these essentially good-natured, if you will, spirited, mm. engineering-minded people right. will have fun picking your lock, okay? And they're not yeah. trying to be mean, but once that lock can be picked, then, Robert, to your point, the people with financial or political motivations that yeah. may be malicious or sinister, that knowledge is now out there, and so they're now able to exploit it. So these are not the same communities, but in terms of what's reasonable, what can be expected, you can expect that your lock, somebody will try to pick your lock even if they're not trying to hurt you. Mm -hmm. And so if your lock can be picked, now you're not the sl you are now the slowest running from the bear, to use another metaphor, right? You don't have to be the fastest running from a bear, just That's not right. the slowest. Well, if, if, the, if the formula for picking your lock is out there, the terrorist, the criminal, the, the discontented employee, the competitor, they're going to come get you because it's just that much easier. Yeah, yeah I, I think that's absolutely right. I think even to give a, a, a physical, real-world example of this, you know, this morning I, I went to the gym at the YMCA, mm -hmm. and I, uh, I left my running shoes and my gym shorts in the locker over there. Um, not a lot of people would really want to take that and walk away with it, although there are some weirdos there that probably <laughs> would. Um, I had it happen before, but still, it's sitting there behind a tiny little crappy padlock. I could pick that lock in about four seconds. I'm telling you, probably less than that. It takes right. less than that to pick this lock, but I don't have it sitting there in an open locker because you know those shoes cost me ninety dollars. I don't use them all that much, obviously, but uh, I think they're still worth protecting. Right. You know, they're my old sweaty gym shoes, but they're sitting behind a lock in that locker. Right. Yeah. Another reason that um, uh, why it's you, know, you have to worry about even the enthusiasts is because of their commitment to um, op uh, openness with knowledge and knowledge sharing, um, even if they're not using their tools for malicious intent, the majority of the time it's released as open source, mm -hmm. and they can be um, can be implemented in um, the tools that that are used by criminal, mm -hmm. like uh, computer criminals. Right. And, and, and just we can wind this up, I think, but but just to take that in the the gym analogy one step further, because mm. about what's reasonable. Reasonable isn't to be as secure as possible. So we talked about a That's lot right. of definitions of what's uh, 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 something that might be worth protecting for different reasons. But if something is not worth protecting, well, one you shouldn't protect it. What's that's over engineering. But also, it's your 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 controls should essentially be proportional to how mm -hmm. worth protecting it is. So, for example, if in your um, gym they didn't offer you a cheap padlock for your locker, mm -hmm. they said, no, you're going to have to use a retinal scan because a retinal scan <laughs> is really infallible. I'm guessing, but as, you know, given, you know, unless you're really committed to working out, you're going to say, that's too much security for me. I'm going to go to the other gym that lets me use a cheap padlock, yeah. right? And so if you make something, if you, if you allow your security measures to get in the way of the reason your application has worked, or it's too expensive so that it ruins, destroys the 
profit margin for, for that worth. Um, well, clearly that's a mistake in the other direction, right? That's right. And, and so um, I, I, I guess I, that's sort of a concluding point. I don't know if you have any thoughts on that, but, but just around what is, just as the technology, Robert, you've made it very clear how the cat and mouse game and the, the mouse is running faster, the technology is racing ahead, but, but, but so is this notion of, of reasonableness changing and shifting. Absolutely. Right? And, and so how, do you, do you have any thoughts either in terms of process or profession or services to, to, to help answer that first question? Not just what, is the, what are the risks associated with the technology stack I'm using, um, but how do I measure what is reasonable? Yes, I, I think... If an application has any value whatsoever, and we're talking about proportionality, then there needs to be at least some measure of protection. Um, if there's any value, then there has to be some protection. You know, as we, if there's no value, then I think you can throw it out there, and that's perfectly fine. And I don't think anybody would disagree with you um, if, or rather, I don't think anybody would be shocked to learn that something was reverse engineered and the source code was compromised because there was no protection on it. But if something has any value whatsoever, if something is worth protecting even in the slightest, then you need to have some security precautions in place. Now think about a company where they develop software and that's all they do. That's their business. And their trade secrets are their source code. Then they need to have, and I would say, extraordinary level of protection when it comes to the protection of that source code, when it comes to the security parameters that you are developing around that particular product. Because if your business model is contingent upon the secrecy of your code, if you ever need to demonstrate that in court, you very much need to demonstrate that you have taken reasonable means of protection. And reasonable here is relative to the value. And I think that's the the part of this that we have to, 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 to sort of end on, which is um, if you have a product that you're selling, let's say, for a million dollars and you have two or three customers there, you have to make sure that that cannot be reverse engineered. Uh, if you're selling a product for 99 cents in an app store and that's going out to a million other people, it's basically the same thing, right? Um, you have to protect against that. You have to defend your trade secrets. I mean, I think the trick of the legal means of protection here and what's reasonable is in the name of the federal law. It's called the Defend Trade Secrets Act, right? We're talking about secrets. Secrets have to be protected. And they have to be done in a manner that is proportional to their economic value. Uh, if we cannot prove that, if that's not alleged in a lawsuit, you're going to have a lot of difficulty proving misappropriation. Um, so, that's, so it's interesting. I just want to sort of call out two things. So, so because um, of our own experience at at Preemptive, mm. um, so I spend a lot of time understanding why people secure their software, and I, as being software developers, I mean, you nailed it, right? Mm. It's it's intellectual property, it's revenue, it's privacy, right. counterfeiting, but you know. Where is the value is a great question. So I read in the Wall Street Journal, it was maybe a year ago, maybe two, but a ATM network mm. was hacked, so they understood it. And so rather than the poor man's attack on an ATM, where you pull up a pickup truck and you yank it out of 7-Eleven, right, and you uh, run away and you have a little while to, to get the money out, um, these people got into the network. And they, it was, uh, according to the Wall Street Journal, it was, a, I believe it was an Eastern European, might have been Russian, uh, organized crime. They just had people go to all the ATMs in a particular city at 1 p.m. Mm. And at that time, all of the ATMs started spitting out money. <laughs> okay? So if you think about the value of that software to that equipment manufacturer that does financial services, that's a multi-billion dollar company, of course. They're losing hard currency. Now, the amount of, they, they you know, ATM manufacturers spend a lot of money on softwares, clearly. Mm. But the bulk of their expenses, I would imagine, is on hardware. Mm -hmm. So it's not software, really, they're, if you look at their balance sheet, right? So all of that is at risk. 
yeah. right, by compromising that software. So it's a different kind. Of, and, and then um, another one I thought was interesting is um, a truck manufacturer. Um, and this is true with a lot of equipment manufacturers that I've seen. They will have m different models, different cameras, different trucks, different measuring devices. Mm -hmm. But they're essentially the same hardware. It's the software that's different that changes its performance, right? Well, the software in cars, of course, is being, you know, now is being hacked for changing the way people drive. This predates this by many years. It wasn't that there was managed code. It wasn't that there was like regular programs running inside cars then. But the appliances that a, a, a mechanic would attach to do diagnostics, there there was software. Yes. And by hacking that software and reverse engineering it, they were able to illegally upgrade trucks. Oh, right. Yeah. And so they were selling, they were pirating essentially truck models yes by manipulating yeah the ODB maintenance two software. software yeah yeah, yeah sure so 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 again and, and and I only bring this up because I think it's important to the to the audience to understand a point that I think I said at the very beginning which is I cannot think of a publicly traded company as well as really any modern company that isn't in some way absolutely dependent on application software in one form or another. And you have to ask yourself when assessing the risk is what's the worst that could happen if this yep. application was turned against me? Not yeah. yeah, I think you have to think of it basically as an existential threat, right? If, if a compromise could cause your company to go out of existence, then you damn well, <laughs> damn well better have, you know, reasonable means of protection. and and. And it, frankly, I think from a legal standpoint, I think what would pass or survive a dispositive motion or motion to dismiss, like, uh, or the summary judgment, for instance, um, isn't a whole hell of a lot. You just have to do something. You really, you, you have to engage in, in, in some means of protection. And then whether that is actually reasonable, you know, that can come out during the trial, but just to survive the first instances of a case, to get into court, you need to have something there. Um, I think it's worth mentioning at this point that, that there was a case a couple of months ago uh, that came out of Kentucky, Federal District Court in Kentucky called Rabin Tire. And Rabin Tire was a case under the Defend Trade Secrets Act where it was alleged that there was confidential and proprietary information. And I put that confidential and proprietary in quotes. That's, that's what was alleged actually in the complaint. And they also subsequently alleged the misappropriation of this confidential and proprietary information. But nowhere in the complaint was any mention whatsoever of any reasonable means of protecting that information. And because that was deficient, uh, despite the liberal pleading standards that we have in federal court, the case was dismissed. And it was dismissed with prejudice, which means that that plaintiff who lost that confidential and proprietary information can never refile that case again. It's over and it's done with. So it's so important to have that as part of your innate business pra practices with respect to any confidential trade secrets that you have, whether it's source code, whether it's employee list, whether it's you know, software that is going to be used to upgrade truck parts, as you mentioned. Um, to have that understanding from basically baked into your business processes means that you're not going to miss it if you ever have to allege it in court. Thank you very much, both of you. Robert, Alex. Thank you. Right. Deeply insightful. Thank you. Always a pleasure. <laughs> yeah.